seminar being hosted by the Regulatory Toxicology Research Division. Our presenter will be Dr. Leroy Lowe. Several of our colleagues here at Health Canada have collaborated with Dr. Lowe's group. Uh, among them, Dr. Jadav Raju arranged the invitation for today's presentation. So before the talk, Jadav will uh, take a few minutes just to provide some background to help contextualize the topic of today's uh, presentation. So Jadav, uh, please. Welcome to you all. Um, Thank you, David. I would like to take a few minutes uh, before Dr. Lowe's lecture to contextualize the work of low-dose exposure to chemical mixtures and their ability to alter the hallmarks of cancer to the food directorate. Understanding the toxic responses to chemical mixtures is not new to our food directorate. Our regulatory toxicology research division within the food directorate has been fortunate to obtain an external grant to study chemical mixtures led by Dr. Don Jin and Dr. Rekha Mehta, the Northern Contaminants Program funded projects that assess oxidative stress responses to a Northern Contaminant Mixture. In the summer of 2012, I was asked by the Division Chief, Dr. Mehta, if I would be interested in being a part of an international con consortium to develop an approach to assess biologically disruptive chemicals that are known to have the ability to act in an adverse manner on important cancer-related mechanism, but not deemed to be carcinogenic to humans. Subsequently, Dr. Mehta co-chaired the team that looked at sustained proliferating signaling, one of the many hallmarks of cancer. And meanwhile, I was grouped into a special cross-validation team to search for evidence of cross-hallmark activity. The validation team's approach was to assess the interaction between potential molecular targets to the cancer hallmark and to determine whether the inhibition or activation of each molecular ta target to the cancer hallmark and to determine whether the, uh, the activity of each chemical might reasonably be expected to have either a pro-carcinogenic or anti-carcinogenic anti effect on key pathways processes in the various hallmarks area. In terms of chemical exposures that were pro-carcinogenic, several priority food chemicals were identified. Notably among them are acrylamide, bisphenol, um, DEHP, phthalates, methylmercury, tributylin, PFOS, etc. I have to emphasize that many of these compounds are currently being investigated not only by the food directorate scientists but also from environmental health. Ultimately, the Halifax project led to 12 co-authored uh, publications in the journal Carcinogenesis. I hope that Dr. Loeb's lecture will emphasize to us here in Health Canada the relevance of chemical mixtures, be it foodborne or through the environment for chemical risk assessment. I acknowledge the presence of Dr. Gilbertson, the, uh, the co-founder of uh, uh, Getting to Know Cancer on the Halifax Project. And finally, I thank Dr. Loeb uh, for accepting our invitation, uh, taking his valuable time and travel at his own expense to Ottawa. Thank you very kindly. Yes. So for this one hour seminar, I welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Leroy Lowe. He is an honorary researcher at Lancaster University in the UK and is president and co-founder of Getting to Know Cancer based out of Nova Scotia. Uh, as Jade have mentioned, he will discuss the topic of chemicals chemical mixtures and cancer. So Dr. Lowe, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you, uh, David and uh, Jadev, and thank you, everybody. Um, it's my honor to be here today to speak to this group. Um, I have a little bit of a story to share, a sort of uh, background on this project. And uh, this is a little bit of an overview of what the day will look like or what this next hour will look like. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to what uh, the project itself, uh, my own background. I'm going to spend some time on cancer biology, and then I'm going to talk about the carcinogenic risk potential associated with low-dose exposures to commonly encountered chemicals. And that's really the subject of the, most of the talk, uh, future research directions and implications for Health Canada. I've 
I've sort of weighted the presentation in that direction, but I've also got a discussion at, towards the end about mixtures of chemicals to reach a broad spectrum of targets for prevention and therapy and as a complement to traditional modes of cancer therapy. And I don't know if we have anybody from the National Health Product, uh, Natural Health Products Directorate in the room. H hands, anybody? No, okay. So I've, uh, but I'll share that at the end if we have, sorry. Okay, okay, so I, I've, I've saved it for the end and we'll sort of see how the time goes. Um, what I'd like to do uh, maybe as a quick survey is I'd like to know how many people um, how many people studied cancer biology in their undergrad or any kind of postgraduate work they might have done? Okay, and how many of you, when you did your undergrad or your postgrad work, um, would have learned about hallmarks of cancer? Probably because it predated, you know, the, the, the framework per se. How many of you could uh, just write the 10 hallmarks of cancer on a piece of paper, like off the top of your head? <laughs> okay. Uh, how many people, if I gave you the hallmarks of cancer, could explain them to somebody who was a lay person? If I showed you the hallmarks and then said, okay, from this list, could you describe it? All right. That, that's kind of what I expected. And it's not, um, it, it, it's just I wanted to get a sense of, you know, what, where the room is at. Um, my background is in aerospace engineering. And uh, I worked in electronics and engineering and... I worked in R&D. Um, I worked with scientists at defense research establishments on the east and west coast. My, uh, I was a scientist by training, I guess, um, not a PhD, but a science, science background. Uh, I was in the Air Force. So I was an aerospace engineering officer in the Air Force. I worked in industry and always in R&D and always on the science side of things. So I very much have a science leaning, but I don't know anything about cancer. And um, I had a... Uh, an aunt die, a childhood friend of mine. She was like 12 and I was five or six and she was like my play friend. And she died of cancer and her father, who was my grandfather, had died uh, when I was in high school and I spent time with him when he was dying. Uh, very, for somebody who was in grade 12, that was a big deal for me. And then when she died much later, but she was like in her 40s, I, I really felt like I needed to know more about cancer and I started learning about cancer, just in my own spare time. I wanted to know about it. And uh, by the way, uh, I have an MBA um, and a master's degree in adult education um, originally, and I, taught biz I teach business full time. Uh, so my excursion into cancer is a bit of an unorthodox entry into the, this area. Um, but I spent, um, I spent eight years of my spare time reading abstracts in PubMed and relearning everything I knew about biology, trying to figure out what the scientists knew about cancer. And I, when I say I spent eight years of my spare time, I mean, I, I started to get a bit obsessed with it. I would get up before breakfast, I would read, I was reading abstracts before breakfast. I would read them over lunch, I would read them in the middle of the afternoon if I had time, often read them be after supper if there was time in the evening, and I read them before bedtime. Um, the thing was is that I thought, well, it can't be that complicated. I, I, uh, I, I just thought, well, I, you know, I'm going to figure this out. And the more I read, the more I realized I didn't know, and I just got deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, after two or three years into something, you're like, you know, it's got to be just a little bit further. Um, and I've put too much time in this just to drop it, so I'm just going to keep going here. And every year the sunk cost became greater and I became more committed that I was going to get to the end, whatever the end looked like. I just, I, was, I had no real objectives in mind. I just wanted to understand what the scientists knew and that turned out to be a much, much, much bigger journey than I ever imagined. If you've tried to get your arms around the whole field of cancer research, you sort of encounter something like this. This is a Garland Science Pathways of Cancer. It's a incredibly complex, looks like a electric circuit, and when you read it in English, it's like reading Japanese, and so most scientists spend their whole careers focused in one area or another, and there are very few general practitioners that sort of do the whole thing. And after eight years, to me, it was like um, one day a light bulb came on. I kind of finally understood what I was looking at, and I mean, 
I don't mean at a really clear level. I mean, I had spent eight years in the forest, and after having looked at enough trees, I sort of thought maybe I understood kind of what the forest looked like. One of the things that I did uh, along the way, this whole process started 15 years ago. My son was only five at the time. Uh, one, somewhere along the way, I picked up a Hallmarks of Cancer paper. The first one was in 2000, so it had been out for a few years. It was the first paper that I read that helped me understand some of the areas of the literature that I was reading. It was a very high-level paper. It sort of said, look, we now know that the phenotypes in cancer consist of many genotypes, but the phenotypes themselves look like this. And it said, you know, here's six areas, six things that we know about uh, cancer, and, and they were referred to as cancer hallmarks. And that paper became enormously cited, not particularly important from a scientist standpoint, but important from a, a big picture standpoint. And most people cited it at the beginning of their paper. It was like, you know, and yes, we know that cancer consists of the following hallmarks. It was a throwaway reference that everybody used, and so citations went to the moon. Um, and the two authors who wrote the paper are, were very prolific, and, and uh, Hannah Hannah Weinberg. And um, so, you know, to their credit, it was a great organizing framework for people to understand. There were things in the, in the paper that were missing that I had been reading about, things like the immune system and cancer metabolism and things like that. But it was, a, it was definitely one of the few papers that could help somebody understand that complex mess. Somewhere around 2010, after I had spent eight years trying to figure this out and then sort of using that paper plus what I knew, felt like I knew what was going on and had this kind of epiphany uh, that I had some sense of what, some, what, what scientists knew. Um, and, and believe me, I'm not making any claims to greatness here. I mean, I'm just saying I felt like I could see the big picture. Um, there, were, there were no particularly fascinating insights at that time. They were just an idea that I understood the big picture, which was hard enough. It was like sort of a cap of my, on my learning. Somewhere around then, 2010, I contacted um, uh, both Hanahan, I, I think it was Bob Weinberg originally, of the authors of this paper, and I said, you know, I'm really, tr you know, I want to thank you for this paper. I know you've been cited so many times and everything. And I said, but what about these other areas that are missing? And uh, he said, oh, that's, you know, I'm glad you asked because we're just about to put out a second paper, which came out a year later. And he said, it's going to include those areas that you're talking about. So ultimately, they produced these two papers, one in 2000 and one 2011, that laid out these um, 10 phenotypes that they say are attributable to most cancers. And I call them phenotypes because they are things that happen in the process of cancer developing that happens in all cancers. Genetically, they might be different. The genotypes might be different. But these things have been achieved one way or another. And it really is a nice organizing framework. And if you start to look around at how people are organized in the research field, in the field of cancer biology, they're often focused in one of these areas. There are people that do genetic instability of cancer are all kind of, they go to the same conferences, they focus on the same kinds of things. And the same is true for many of these things. People that focus on the immune system and immune system evasion, they focus on the same thing. So it's a nice organizing framework. With that said, I'm just going to walk you through it uh, slowly. Um, at a high level, we're not going to go too deep, but I want all of you to understand the framework. Right now, if I go take an undergrad in science, I can take a course called Hallmarks of Cancer, and any undergrad can get this in like one semester. Um, and at even a much, level, deep level, a much deeper level than what we're going to do today, but I'm saying these hallmarks are fairly easy conceptually to understand. But you really need to see them and understand them to appreciate what happened in the Halifax Project, what we did, and why it's important, and what its implications are for your work at Health Canada. So bear with me, but we're going to go through these one at a time. Um, so the first thing is that in a cancer cell, typically they are genetically unstable. Now, we know and the initiating events in a lot of cancers, and certainly the ones that we found out about earliest, were mutagenic initiations. And they were random damage to cells that caused things to go awry. And that damage, uh, which is a form of instability, was sort of an initiating thing. But once cancer gets underway, the cells themselves are genetically unstable. Even though they're immortalized and making copies of themselves, they're also making mutant copies of themselves, which makes cancer particularly hard to treat. 
But the fact is there is a genetic instability in these uh, replicating cells, and that genetic instability is sometimes the initiating event, and sometimes it's part of the process as cancer unfolds and mutant clonal populations emerge as these um, cells make copies of themselves. And so we get subpopulations of cells as well that are all immortalized, but um, they're different versions of immortalization, different genotypes, if you will. Um, this it has two sides to it. The first is the genetic instability itself, and that can be caused, as I said, from mutagen, but it can also be due to inadequate repair because there are several different repair systems at the cellular level that can fix DNA. There's a repair system for single-strand breaks and a repair system for double-strand breaks, and DNA has a series of you know, six or seven systems that are actually break different can fix different types of rearrangements, and cells that uh, are in cancerous formation, immortalized cells, don't have the ability to keep up. The damage is there, it's continuing, it's ongoing, and the DNA repair is somehow inadequate. Um, on top of that, we have the cells are proliferating, sustained proliferative signaling, and the evasion of anti-growth signaling. So, not only are there growth signals that won't stop, and those can be inherent to the cells themselves, self-produced sustained proliferative signaling, or they can be due to the milieu, the, the tumor microenvironment where the cells are found, that the sustained sig growth signaling is happening. And the anti-growth signaling, the kinds of checkpoints in the cell cycle, for example, that should be saying, wait, this shouldn't be happening, stop, those, the breaks, if you will, are not working. And there's uh, tumor suppressors like P53 and PRB. These are mechanisms that if you're in cancer biology are, you know, we've been talking about them for 25 years. There are these mechanisms that should stop the cell from proliferating and they're not working. Um, <clears throat> the fourth one is uh, resistance to cell death. Now there are several types of cell death. There are extrinsic pathway, forms where the cells are being acted on by receptors externally and there are intrinsic pathway, internal mechanisms that cause a cell to shut down. But for example, if a cell had damage, normally there should be a checkpoint uh, stop that says, wait, this, this cell has damage, has it been repaired yet? We'll stop and do a repair. If the repair doesn't affect or if the repair doesn't happen, the cell is supposed to have an automatic sequence where it dies. And that automatic sequence is uh, known as apoptosis, is one of several avenues of cell death that can occur. And in cancerous cells, this is broken. It doesn't work. And so what happens, and it's a and it's very complicated set of machinery, which we've now teased out over the last 20, 30 years. There are scientists who just focus on apoptosis, for example. That's their whole world, and there's whole groups of people doing it. The point is, is that this phenotype, this resistance to cell death, is in all these immortalized cells. They all have this broken. Um, that process means that we have cells that are proliferating. They haven't repaired themselves. The breaks are not working anymore. The um, cell is supposed to self-destruct, and it's not self-destructing, and it continues to proliferate. And so we've already run through a number of potential layers of defense here from this happening, and yet it's still occurring. Then we have replicative immortality. Most cells are supposed to have a limit on how many times they can copy, and when they've copied too many times, they're supposed to senesce. Um, this bypassing of senescence is, uh, enables this sort of replicative immortality, that they can become immortalized. The telomeres on a cell's chromosomes shorten. Every time a copy is made, they are supposed to reduce a little bit. And they reduce like they wear out, like breaks. And so they wear out, and they wear out, and they wear out. And at some point, the cell has copied too many times, it's supposed to stop making copies of itself. This system has been bypassed. Now, there's an enzyme called telomerase that can put uh, additional <clears throat> length back on these telomeres. So there's a a well-described system that can be invoked to allow these cells to produce beyond their normal limits. But in cancerous cells, they've created this sort of immortalized phenotype where they're bypassing this normal uh, senescence on a regular basis. 
Then we have dysregulated metabolism. And I've just shown here one cell that has started to make copies of itself, and it's turned into this tumorous mass, and in this little cartoon. And you can see the different colors of cells represent different mutant clonal populations that are all immortalized. They're all making copies of themselves. Um, and you can imagine that if this little tumorous mass wasn't, it didn't have vasculature, if it didn't have blood vessels that fed it oxygen, that the cells that are in the middle of the mass would be starving for oxygen. Under normal circumstances, a, t a tissue will have its own vasculature and the cells are being fed by blood, which brings oxygen to those cells. And in a tumorous mass where too many cells are forming in a space that previously didn't have enough vasculature for that many cells, the cells that are in the middle of that tumorous mass become hypoxic. They're not having an adequate amount of oxygen to feed them. Cells that are in that environment shift in a process, uh, shift the metabolism of the cell shift to, shifts to glycolysis so that those cells can draw their energy elsewhere. They draw it from glucose and glycine. And there's a very complicated cycle. People that do dys dysregulated cancer metabolism have a very different set of skills than most other cancer scientists because it's a lot of chemistry, Krebs cycle, it's all different things related to the cellular metabolism that is very complicated, sort of its own subdomain of specialty. The point that you need to understand is that those cells are, have shifted into this different mode, which can allow them to sustain themselves despite the fact that they don't have enough oxygen, which is another reason why the, the tumor continues to grow. Now, normally, if you get a tumor, your immune system should just come, come along and shut it down. Cells have little receptors on the surface of them called MHC class two, and there's other means as well. They're little antennas that they put up to say, I'm in distress. Like, hey, my cell death system didn't work. I didn't get the damage repaired. And internally, I've got nothing to stop this from going on, but I know I'm out of line here. So could you come and shut me down? And then there's a whole bunch of effectors within the immune system natural killer cells, T cells, CD4, CD8 T cells, uh, macrophage, dendritic cells. There's a whole army of immune system um, that is supposed to do surveillance and say, oh, I recognize that cell's in trouble, we'll go shut it down. And they have various means to do that. Externally, they can try to put the cell into um, its own cell death cycle. If that doesn't work, they can engulf it and then dissolve it. Um, there's lots of different ways that that can happen. But in the immune system in cancer, the immune system is not functioning properly. The cells either don't recognize it, or the cancerous cells themselves are not putting up their little antenna to say, hey, I'm in trouble. Um, the, 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 the system that's supposed to find those cells and the cells that are supposed to be found have found ways to avoid one another. And that system is broken as well. Then we have angiogenesis, and these cells that are hypoxic and needing oxygen uh, put out something called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, and other um, uh, factors as well, but they basically say, hey, bring us oxygen over here, we need it. And uh, in an environment that has a lot of VEGF and other kinds of factors that are calling for new vasculature, the blood system will actually put new vasculature around the tumor to try and make sure those cells get the oxygen they apparently are calling for and need. And so in a typical tumor, you have this sort of tangled mass of um, capillaries and, and uh, all around the vas uh, vasculature, all around the tumor, feeding blood into the tumor that also allows it to survive, despite the fact that there wasn't um, any space there for them to survive previously. And as you can see in this diagram, which shows this tangled mass around this tumor, there's little uh, cells coming out the end there called metastatic spread. Because as you can imagine, what happens is some of those cells from the tumor escape into the vasculature, and they end up in your bloodstream, which allows them to go to other parts of your body and colonize in other places, which is, you know, the next step in most cancers. Additionally, I will point out that roughly 25% of the mass of a tumor is uh, infiltrate. Um, the tumor itself is, uh, some people have referred to it as a wound that won't heal. 
There's long been known to be a connection between chronic inflammation in the body and the occurrence of cancers. And in fact, what happens is a lot of these cytokines, um, MIF, macrophage, migratory, inhibitory factor, TNF-alpha, NF-kappa-beta, there's a lot of different constituents of the uh, in inflammation and inflammation cascade that are pro-carcinogenic. The, like a wound, um, in a typical wound, if you got cut, uh, you get up in the morning, you cut yourself, there would be a um, call for the cells to replenish themselves. The cells need to grow. And so a lot of the different things that are called for in a wound where there's inflammation are related to cellular growth. And that feeds the tumor because those cells need an ongoing set of signals to help them grow. So inflammation is actually a key event in most cancers where the tumor itself has all these white blood cells and other factors generating this sort of uh, infiltrate or producing this infiltrate around the tumorous mass that continues to feed the process and allow this thing to sustain itself. And uh, of course, we go from what was previously quite orderly cells that were all connected and talking to one another and in the form that you would find in a normal tissue to this sort of transition to a mesenchymal uh, uh, phenotype. And the people that have done work on tissue invasion and metastasis call this transition the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, where cells that were all connected and talking to one another uh, through changes in their disorder, in their normal, regular functioning, they become more like cancer stem cells. In fact, cancer stem, step, excuse me, cancer stem cells are uh, previously orderly cells that have become immortalized and they've lost their orderly nature and they now become free agents, if I could use that term. They're on their own. They break away from the cells around them. They're no longer talking to cells around them. And yet, if they promulgate and make copies of themselves, now you've got a bunch of cells that are capable of producing populations of cells that can make copies of themselves. That's a problem. Um, this is called the epithelial mesenchymal transition, if I didn't mention it already. And lastly, we have the tumor microenvironment. Now, this isn't even referred to as a hallmark, but the fact is you can take a cancerous tumor out of an animal and put it in an animal that's healthy, and the cells that surround the tumor will stop it from growing. The cells around have the ability through communication and their own signaling of creating order amongst cells that are disordered. But in a person who has cancer or an animal who has cancer, not only are the cells that are in the tumor disordered, but they've actually co-opted and are talking to and communicating with the stromal cells and fibroblasts and the other cells in the tumor microenvironment, and those cells are all, all being permissive. They've actually allowed those cells to behave the way that they're behaving in a way that's not normal. In fact, if you talk to the people that are focused on the tumor microenvironment, many of them believe that this is what causes cancer. Now, I'm not saying that's a widespread view in the cancer community. What I'm saying is there are people who believe that the tumor microenvironment is it, that if we can fix the tumor microenvironment, we'll cure all cancers. There's other people who say, well, if you start with a tumor, you'll end up with tumor microenvironment that will support it, and it's part of the process. Whether it's chicken or the egg, uh, these two things have to work hand in hand. Now, why did I just spend all that time showing you cancer biology? Because if you don't understand how cancer unfolds and understand that basic high-level biology, you can't understand what we did. And I know that that's not something that everybody maybe would have studied or know about, but I wanted you to see that because it becomes really important. The first thing I have to say is that I just want you to take note here, just pause at the end, and I want you to, I want you to see how many layers of defense have been beaten in the process here. The DNA repair, which should have stopped damage to begin with, the kinds of things that mutagenesis would invoke, DNA repair has somehow failed. The tumor suppressors that should have stopped the cells from continuing to replicate, they're not working. They've been interrupted, if you will. The cell death process, whether that's apoptosis, autophagy, or one of the others, those are, those are not happening as they're supposed to happen. Senescence, this idea that cells are stopped making copies of themselves, that process has been bypassed. And the cells themselves that are transitioned to this epithelial mesenchymal transition, which allows them to then 
metastasize and colonize elsewhere in the body. Though that transition has occurred, and, and that's been bypassed. Normally, that doesn't happen. On an extracellular basis, outside the cell, the immune system has, has failed to do its job. And your stress axis, your HPA axis, hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis, which produces cortisol, which in turn produces cortisone in, uh, in your bloodstream, which is used to shut down inflammation typically, and MIF particular at the top of the inflammation cascade, cortisone and MIF are yin and yang, if you will, of inflammation and stopping inflammation, that's not working properly. And that whether that's happening at the cellular level or whether it's happening at the systemic level doesn't matter. The point is, is that the normal defenses that your body would have to stop that from happening aren't working. And the tissue interactions around the, around the uh, tumor are supporting what's going on, which allows this to develop. That's a lot of different layers of defense that have been bypassed in the process of this happening. It took me eight years to get to the point that I could even understand what was happening, and that was just because I was doing it on my own time. <laughs> and I'm not very smart about how I approached it. I could now do it in one semester online probably somewhere. Um, but anyway, that's how I did it. Uh, but I, in, in seeing all that, one of the things that struck me was that we now actually have um, chemicals that can act on all those hallmarks in a favorable manner. And if you look at, uh, if you type hallmarks of cancer in and you look on the internet for images, you'll find a diagram that looks like this that shows the different kinds of drugs that have been developed, chemistry that can go in and act specifically either in the extracellular or intracellular components, and very precisely through lock and key kind of mechanisms that we know that receptors require or passing through the outside of the cell and actually acting internally to the cell, uh, different ways we've developed that we understand now how to act on all these different hallmark areas in a way that's anti-carcinogenic. Impressive. This has been some of our best uh, advances in targeted cancer therapies have come from scientists who have figured out how the biology works and said, hey, if we can get one chemical to go in and act on that one mechanism, we can, we can change what cancer does. That's what we've learned from cancer therapeutics, that chemicals can act on each of these mechanisms in very precise and targeted manner. That's really valuable from a therapeutic standpoint. But the question that I would ask you, and I'll flip it around, is what about mixture effects? What does that mean? That means that individual chemicals can act on these mechanisms precisely in ways that may help or hinder these hallmarks develop. And the question that was on my mind at the time was, well, what does that mean for chemicals we're exposed to every day? Chemicals that are not carcinogenic by themselves, but individually act on these mechanisms the same way that cancer drugs do. Isn't that something we should at least ask about? <clears throat> but when I talked to scientists that were doing mixtures research, they were nowhere near this. And it's not because they weren't interested in it, it's just because it's taken us 20 to 30 years just to get to the point where we can describe this. You know, it's one of those things where it looked more complicated than it was, but now that we have get it to where we understand it, you can take it as a half one semester undergrad course. And, and within, from that lens, it changes the way we might approach mixtures research, in particular how we might appro approach analyzing whether or not something is carcinogenic or whether mixtures could be carcinogenic. Now, <clears throat> of course, toxicology has a long history of looking for mutagens. This is not a mistake. This was really like brilliant. You know, Ames' work in the 70s with the Ames assay and all that followed, that whole hunt for mutagens as carcinogens was fruitful. We did identify chemicals that did create random kinds of damage, and we found things that caused cancer. That was all very productive. But it brought with it a mindset in toxicology that we were looking for single actors that caused cancer. And we, taught, we taught, thought of cancer as a monolith. It was a single thing. And we were looking for things that caused cancer. That was our goal. With that kind of a backdrop, <clears throat> it becomes difficult to see how mixtures matter. 
I want to overlay on that Dahl and Peter's work in 1981. Most of you will be familiar with this. It drove 30 years of focus on lifestyle factors. Richard Dahl and Richard Pito wrote this paper in 1981. It was a landmark paper. And they said that occupation, pollution, industrial products, et cetera, was probably 6% of the problem. In other words, we've got bigger fish to fry. It's all, all this other lifestyle stuff is... 94% of the problem, let's focus there. That's the low-hanging fruit. And people that were focused on chemicals and cancer quickly found they didn't have many people listening to them. Nobody wanted to hear about chemicals and cancer. It was a small part of the problem. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, but go look it up in the peer-reviewed literature. You know, three years prior to this paper coming out, Richard Dahl started a long-standing consulting agreement with Monsanto where he was being paid a lot of money. And people have questioned whether or not that work and subsequent work he did on behalf of industry that questioned the veracity of certain epidemiological studies was actually founded in truth or whether it was somehow a product of the work he had been asked to do. I'm not here to talk about that issue. I'll just raise it as a question mark because... Some 40 years later, in a research that his original research partner took part in or was involved in, came this study in 2010 in the UK, the forward of an entire special issue on the best epidemiology could tell us about what the causes of cancer were, and Richard Pito wrote the forward to this paper long after Richard Dahl had deceased, and it was in his post humus uh, discovery that we, they'd found these papers relating to his consulting arrangements with the chemical industry. R Richard Pito wrote a, the forward to this paper, which was an entire special issue dedicated to saying, how much can epidemiology tell us about what we know causes cancer? And the end of the best review that science had to offer in 2010 was that 43% of all cancers can be attributed to both lifestyle and environmental factors based on our epidemiology. What does that mean? It means that 57% of all cancers, as of this study, are probably due to undiscovered, unavoidable causes. Now that's a frightening number. It should have, been, it should have echoed around the world. But you can still talk to old timers today, the most esteemed scientists we have, who have for the last 30 years believed that Chemicals, they're probably 5% of the problem. Why are you wasting your time there? And these are luminaries in cancer because they've, for the 30 years, that's been a safe statement. And now we've got a completely paradigm-changing view. Maybe we don't understand as much as we thought we understood. Who would have believed that we don't understand what 57% of the causation of cancer is? That's a huge number. And if you go and look into this, do, the, do your homework. There's an NCI paper in 2012 that tried to figure out, out of all the studies that are out there, you know, what do we know? And basically they said we don't know. So I'm just bringing it to your attention because if you're believing that why are we worried about chemicals in cancer, I'm telling you it's something that you need to be vigilant of. 40 to 50% of the population is getting to cancer in their lifetime, and I would argue that we really don't know what's causing a lot of those cancers. The numbers are way bigger than tobacco smoking. You only have to look at this organization, Health Canada, and look for who's interested in cancer and chemicals. It's a very small group. And it's not a fault of the organization, it's just where we are. Every organization in every country in the world has had the same thing happen. When the early days, when we didn't know what was causing cancer, though lots of people studying cancer and chemicals and cancer. Then when we thought it wasn't a problem, we had 20 or 30 years focusing on lifestyle. It got pushed over to public health, and it was not really something that we needed to worry about because it's too small of a part of the problem. And the scientists who have been stuck on this for 20 or 30 years have been very lonely. They don't get a lot of funding and they don't get a lot of airtime. But it's something that we need to revisit. And look around organizationally at, at, at what Health Canada is doing with respect to carcinogenesis, and you'll see that it's, it's diminished from where it would have been. And that's not Health Canada's uh, fault. I'm just saying that's where we are in, in history. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I was a non-scientist, at least uh, not a PhD. I had no back formal background in cancer biology, and my concern was what about can chemical mixtures and, and cancer? And I started to contacting mixture scientists who said, we think this is a big problem, but nobody will listen to us. And, um, and not exactly like that. I mean, these aren't poor scientists. These are just people that are telling me what the, their world is like. Um, I reached out to Theo Colborn, who does low-dose work, and said, you know, this is what I'm working on, and she pointed me to Michael Gilbertson, uh, Dr. Michael Gilbertson, thank you and welcome. Um, and she said, Michael can help you, we, we've been working on low-dose stuff for 20 years, and, and he's, he's going to be really interested in this topic. Michael and I started talking about this, and we decided to, to set up a nonprofit to study the problem. Now, we didn't set up a nonprofit to raise money. Uh, in fact, the nonprofit is really just Michael and I. Um, we just needed an organization so that we had an organization. And we, we formed an advisory board and we put out a call to scientists that were studying chemicals in cancer and said, would you be interested in being on the advisory board? We want to put together a big project to look at this. At this. We actually didn't know how we were going to fund it. And we came up with this idea that it would just be a review process, but we would get everybody engaged and, and break down some of the silos that exist, even in the cancer biology world, because those people don't all talk to one another. And we wanted to bring cancer biology folks with risk assessment people together and let the worlds collide. <laughs> um, we got 350 scientists from 31 countries involved and organized them into 24 teams. And half of them, 174, were a part of the Chemical Mixtures Task Force. The other task force I'll talk about at the end if we have time. And we might not have time. And the goal was to use cutting-edge cancer biology to inform toxicology and risk assessment. That was what we were focused on. And to put in a coherent argument in the peer-reviewed literature to, to give some assessment as to whether we thought this was an issue or not. Um, we don't have any particular ties. We're not connected to industry. We're not connected to any um, institutions. Michael's retired, and I dropped a bunch of consulting work that I was doing. I, I teach business part-time, international business, and uh, I did a bunch of cons private consulting for companies, uh, software and electronics companies. I dropped all my consulting, and we just said, let's do this. Um, one of the scientists got, managed to get us an NIEHS super grant uh, fund um, sponsorship for 25K to help us give some of the scientists that wanted to come to the workshop travel money. We didn't get any of it. It was just travel money. And uh, I sent out a proposal to a bunch of top journals and said, would any of you be interested in carrying a special issue if we put together a series of reviews on this topic? And we got one, and I raised money from all the scientists uh, for participation fees to pay for open access. So when I think when the project was I think when the project opened, I had not, no money in the bank account, and when the project closed, I had $100 in the bank account. I mean, with the, there's no money in the organization. We're both volunteers. So um, as the project got underway, uh, the EPA did a fascinating piece of research. And if you don't know Nicole Kleinstrauer and you have any occasion to meet her or talk to her, she's a dynamo and terrific. She was involved in the project, but she did a really cool piece of research. And as soon as I read the paper, I was like, I have to talk to that woman. And I called her up. And her paper was called In Vitro Pertub Perturbations of Targets in Cancer Hallmark Processes Predict Rodent Chemical Carcinogenesis. Now, I read the paper and I was like, wow, this is awesome. This is what we need to be looking, this is how we need to approach this problem. She's right on. And I'm gonna give you a very simplified view of what they did. She had a giant spreadsheet and her, her group does in vitro high throughput screening work. And they have a massive database. Um, and they started with 292 chemicals and 672 assays. And they put all the chemicals through all the assays and they grouped all the assays by hallmark area, and they tried to identify which chemicals were active in which hallmark area. So, you know, this is in vitro, so it's not in vivo, but they were just trying to get some general sense as to whether or not they could put bins around things. If something was acting on sustained proliferative signaling mechanisms and, and appeared to be structurally the right kind of chemical to have that kind of an action, let's keep, peek, take note of that. If it has to do with the kind of machinery that would disrupt normal cellular apoptosis, let's keep track of that. And I've shown them here as 10 bins, but you can imagine there were many assays for each bin. So this spreadsheet was much wider than this. But in general, they were grouping these chemicals by, by hallmark area, which was neat, I thought, because it was what we were interested in. 
And then she had 292 chemicals going down the side of her spreadsheet. It was like chemical one, chemical two, chemical three, and then what was the activity across all these assays? Cool. Their idea was they had two year, this is, these are all food grade chemicals. They have two year in vivo rodent data on all these chemicals. So they know whether or not these chemicals are, were carcinogenic, tested to be carcinogenic, how much, how carcinogenic were they? And then they have these uh, sort of, you know, how active were they across these hallmark areas in terms of enabling the chemical machinery inside the cell or outside the cell that would be relevant. And their, their hypothesis was, a chemical that acted across many of these areas, highly active across all these hallmarks, would be more carcinogenic than one that only acted on one or two. Fairly simple correlative study. And it worked. So I called her up and I said, this is, you know, fantastic work. I'm like, this is great. Why did you do this and what, tell me more about it. And she said, well, you know, we have all these chemicals. They're all in foods and we're interested in them. And we wanted to know if some chemical was like really active across all these areas, if that meant something from a carcinogenesis standpoint. And it did. And I said, so you were trying to prioritize these chemicals? She was like, yes, because if we could have new chemicals or whatever, we can run them through all these high throughput screens, and that'll give us the answer that we're looking for. Well, I said, what, <clears throat> what about the fact that all those chemicals are in all of our food? <laughs> like, what about the fact that if we take all 292 of them and put them in a mixture and give them to you in your breakfast, does it matter? Yeah, well, that's the problem. We don't know what to do with that. <laughs> So we felt like we were on the right track, okay? Now, I'm not saying I know something here. I'm just saying, what about the fact that we've got chemicals that act on all these areas and we're mixing them all together and putting them on your breakfast cereal? We need to know something about it. That's what the science is telling us. So we had 12 teams, and they were organized mainly by hallmark area, 11 hallmark areas, uh, 10 hallmark areas, plus the tumor microenvironment, and then a utility team called the cross-validation team, which was in fact the team Jayadev was on, I guess, and they looked at uh, all the hallmark areas collectively. And what happened was we asked each of them to identify priority pathways in each area, things that if they were disrupted would contribute towards a cancerous state, and up to 10 chemicals of interest. Now this is what's interesting. We said we want chemicals that everybody's exposed to. You can't avoid them. Stuff that's everywhere. We want things that are selectively disruptive, so not mutagenic, not random, indiscriminate damage to the cell. We want chemicals that act like cancer drugs, ones that have been tested and it's like, oh, this chemical acts on that mechanism, and somebody put up their hand and said, hey, come look at this, toxophene or some other chemical acts specifically on this mechanism, and that's interesting. So we, we said, find us chemicals that are uh, selectively disruptive and not lifestyle related. We don't want tobacco smoke and we don't want things that are related to obesity or whatever. We're just looking for things that would have normally been off of everybody's radar. It's kind of stuff that would be generally recognized, safe stuff that's in your food, whatever. And things that are not carcinogenic. We don't want carcinogens. People have studied carcinogens to death. Give us chemicals that aren't carcinogens. And the groups went away, and what did they come up with? Well, they put together 85 examples of chemical actions on key mechanisms, and 50 out of the 85 of them were active at dose levels that are typical of what we would find in the environment. So the first thing that happened when we put this in for review, this is an oversight on my part, I wrote the first draft of this manuscript in uh, conjunction with Bill Goodson, and two other uh, authors, there was a small team of us that did the first draft, and we iterated the manuscript with pieces of it came from all of the teams, the synthesis manuscript, and then we iterated it many times with inputs from everybody. It was a huge uh, undertaking. But I had not, and I wrote the original instructions for the teams, and I didn't ask them to quantify what had been done from a low dose standpoint, which was part, what, what we had set out to do, so I don't know how I missed it, but it was just not in there. And then one of the reviewers came back and said, okay, this is really interesting that you found these 85 chemicals that act on these mechanisms in this manner. He said, but the, probably most of them in dose response testing will have shown to have a point of departure from a risk assessment standpoint that make, you know, with a safety factor of 100 down to what's normal in the environment, we don't have to worry about it. And we went, okay, right, thank you for telling us that. And uh, we grabbed our three top toxicologists, uh, Reka, uh, Meta, uh, Anna Maria Kalachi, who's uh, from the 
equivalent of Health Canada in Italy and Nicole Kleinstrauer from NIHS, and we said, can you guys quickly go and find the low-dose work that's been done on these chemicals and find out how active these were, whether these were linear low-dose uh, relationships, whether there was any extrapolation work done at all, whether there was low-dose activity, whatever, and they very rapidly and brilliantly put together a nice little table that summarized, and lo and behold, 50 of these chemicals had been demonstrated to be active at the kinds of dose levels that would matter in the environment. That was really neat. I'm really going long here, so I'm going to have to speed up. Um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, 20 of these hadn't even been tested for low dose response, for low dose effects was interesting because we had no dose response information, but only 22 of these chemicals were, had points of departure that made them sort of irrelevant uh, in terms of what we were looking for. We were looking for chemicals that could act at normal environmental levels. So you didn't have to be exposed any more than you would be exposed on a day to day basis. Now, so what? You know, uh, what did we find out? Look, all I can say is that from our standpoint, it was fascinating that these were just examples. This is not any kind of thorough review. We didn't go out and, and take tens of thousands of chemicals and screen them all or test them all. We just said, based on what you've seen in the literature already, based on what's been researched or done already, show us some good exemplars. And we weren't trying to identify bisphenol A as being a culprit or something. Our, we had no goals to demonize any single chemical. We just wanted to ask whether or not this could be a problem that we need to be focused on and concerned about. And we identified chemicals in all of the hallmark areas that were relevant and, and at dose levels that it would be typical of what we would find in the environment. So that's interesting. The hypothesis that we emerged with, and it is a hypothesis, is that low-dose exposures to mixtures of chemicals in the environment may be acting in concert with one another to cause cancers. That was the hypothesis we started the project with. So did we really do anything? I think, you know, when you look at what we did, we did a special issue. It was 12 articles that broke down each area of Hallmark in detail in terms of what are the pathways that are important, why do they matter, how do they relate to the other pathways, and what are the kinds of chemicals that we have evidence of that act in this manner, and how is that interesting, plus the synthesis paper. And if you haven't read it, it's Goodson et al., um, Jay Adev, I'm sure, will post it or send it to you or go to gettingtoknowcancer.org website and look for it under chemicals and cancer. It's an open access paper. It's uh, Goodson and 174 other author authors. It was the synthesis paper. And our goal was to make an articulate argument in the peer-reviewed literature that explained what I just explained to you. And we wanted to make it accessible to people that weren't cancer biologists and didn't necessarily, didn't know about the hallmarks of cancer and didn't understand how the disease manifests, it unfolds, that it's a multi-step, multi-stage disease, that it's got many processes and that we have chemicals that act discriminately and in a very focused way on those mechanisms. And we wanted to show the scientific community both risk assessment and science, basic uh, bench scientists that are doing research work, we wanted to show them why this is potentially an issue. Now, the funny thing is we've got a starting point that's kind of feeble. Most health agencies like yourselves and regulatory agencies have kind of dropped off their two-year rodent work. A lot of them have diminished the importance they put on cancer. They're not really looking at this. It's not a big issue. And most people, if you look around in your own labs and say who's responsible for Food, whether or not the fact that this particular chemical causes oxidative stress or whatever, whether or not that matters from a cancer standpoint. Most people focus on these bits in isolation and they're not thinking about how those pieces of the puzzle fit together. That's a problem for agencies like yourselves that need to be able to see this coherent picture because it, it, it has to do with neuro, uh, neurotoxicology, it has to do with toxicology in all parts of the body, it's system level thinking, cancer it involves things like the stress axis, which is a distributed system, things like the immune system, which is a distributed system, and so any focus on something that isolates cancer down to something that happens at one place at one time is so narrowly scoped it really failed to capture what really can, can and may be the issue that we're facing here. So. Let me just put a couple of caveats in here. Does that mean we should all go home and be afraid? No, no. And, and we weren't trying to set off alarm bells. We wanted to produce a coherent academic argument to explain to people how this works so they would understand it. 
tissue fade is a big thing. You know, if I take 20, 10 chemicals that are all act on the hallmarks of cancer in some sort of enabling way, and they, some chemicals end up in my kidney and some end up in my heart and some end up in my brain, but they don't intermix, then maybe we don't have to worry about it. You know, these, these chemicals need to coalesce somewhere. But we do have uh, radio tracer labeling studies and toxicology from historical rodent work that's been done that shows that certain chemicals have certain affinities for certain tissues, and certainly there's low-hanging fruit. We could look for chemicals that we know act on a particular organ and that we know tend to accumulate in a particular organ, and we could look at those mixtures from a hallmark standpoint and determine. But typically, people who do mixtures work focus on mixtures of chemicals based on the chemicals. Let's do a study of dioxins, or let's do a study on phthalates, or let's do a study on whatever, and they focus on the chemicals and groups of those chemicals. In fact, we should be looking at disparate chemicals that we know accumulate in similar tissues and looking at how those act on hallmarks and whether or not the combination of those actions on those hallmarks is enabling in some way for carcinogenesis. The second thing that came very clear when you go dig in the literature and say, how does Kant's carcinogenesis actually occur? is that that's really an area that there's a lot of basic research that's still needed, unfortunately. The nice thing is for anybody who's doing chemicals in cancer is that this is great ground for publishing. Now, I'm not just about publishing, but I'm just saying there's a lot of work to be done here. The fact is, is that carcinogenesis is a bit of a black box. The hallmarks of cancer describe what happens to a full-blown cancer. Now, presumably, if in a full-blown cancer, uh, P53 has been bypassed, and that's creating some thing where the tumor suppressors aren't working, that that had to happen somewhere along the way in the process of carcinogenesis. But the actual steps that cause that to unfold, we don't have that. But that would be fascinating mixtures research work where you incrementally disrupt one thing and then disrupt another and then in temporally change the way these things are introduced and see whether or not you can get cancers to unfold using different incremental chemically instigated means of invoking chemical carcinogenesis using non-carcinogens at low doses, right? This is work that hasn't been done. Look, uh, and I'm almost finished here. Um, some people who are focused on mode of action are critical of this work because we're critical of mode of action. Well, we're not really critical of mode of action. Mode of action and adverse outcome pathways are valuable tools. We know that. Um, there's nothing wrong with mode of action. Mode of action describes from an instigating event the series of steps that occur all the way till an adverse outcome. An adverse outcome pathway maybe is described slightly differently, but essentially they end up being the same thing. If a chemical causes this to happen and it occurs in this tissue in this manner, and at the end you have a disease like cancer, then that's a concern. And if we had three of those chemicals that acted with this instigating event that followed the same pathway and came out with the same disease outcome from a mixture standpoint and cumulative effects from a risk assessment standpoint, we'll stack them together. We're, gonna, we're interested in those effects. We can stack them together. But that's not how cancer is, is built. The biology is more nuanced than that. I, I don't mean that's not what happens. That, that does happen for some chemicals. But lots of things happen here, and it's a dis these are distributed systems. So you could have one chemical acting on the immune system and one chemical acting on your immune inflammation suppression system and one chemical acting at a cellular level, and yet collectively those things should conspire to produce the kinds of things that we would be concerned about. And you would miss those nuances in mixtures research if you only ever stacked chemicals that acted precisely the way, same way on precisely the same tissues in precisely the same manner. And we think that's a big oversight in our regulatory framework that will be resolved. It's not resolved, and it's not a critical. It's not a criticism of the risk assessment people. And most risk assessment people look at this and say, "Oh, you know, well, that's just you know, how would you ever deal with 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 chemicals? We'll never get there." Um, I don't know quite how we're going to get there. I'm putting it on your radars because the, the biology is telling us that we need systems to catch up, and that's part of you know what we hope to do in this process is to help people understand it well enough to see why it matters and that our current risk assessment framework is quite narrowly constructed.
So it's not a criticism of mode of action. It's just simply saying that it's good for what it does, but it's missing the potential of the other kinds of confluences that we talked about. In practice, mode of action data is limited. And in, and in reality, that means that cumulative effects are often not being considered. I spent hours and hours and hours digging through EPA documents on cumulative effects and reading entire risk assessments, one chemical at a time. And I can't tell you how many times I said that we know of no other chemical that has the same mode of action and therefore cumulative effects are not an issue. But I can tell you on mutagenicity alone, you know, there are lots of chemicals that have been tested in two-year rodent studies that were mutagens but didn't turn out to be carcinogens. And so we allow them into the food supply, for example. And yet when we look at mutagens, we don't stack them all up. We don't say, well, we know there are 400 chemicals that are mutagens, so we're going to be concerned about whether or not those 400 chemicals together are mutagens. And the reason is, is because individually they don't cause an adverse outcome. They don't cause cancer, and therefore it doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about it. There is no mode of action, and since there's no mode of action, we don't have to worry that there's 400 chemicals that are in our food that, ca that are cause mutagens. Similarly, if you take DNA repair, it's a simple example. If you take a mutagen and you, and you disable DNA repair, the mutagenic effects are exaggerated because you create damage and then you can't fix the damage. So you take a chemical that disrupts DNA repair, it doesn't cause cancer, but if you put it with a mutagen that doesn't cause cancer, so neither of them are eligible for mode of action analysis, we now have something that could cause cancer, but normally it gets repaired and we test it, and then we put it with something that breaks down the repair system, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, now we're putting two things together that are making it worse, and, but we don't test them together because we can't do mode of action analysis on it. Think of it this way. I like to think of all these layers of defense. Imagine we lived in a world where we found that in our neighborhood, people were stealing the brake systems out of cars. Every once in a while, you'd go out in the morning, you'd get in your car, and the front brakes, the back, the front brake pads from the front had been removed. They'd taken the tires off, taken the brake pads out, put the tires back on, and the brakes in the front have gone, the brakes in the back are gone, and your emergency brake system is gone. You go down the road, and you go to hit the, the brakes, and there's no brakes, so you hit the emergency brake, there's, there's not even a stick, it's been taken right out of your car, and you say, and you crash, and you die, and the police analyze it and say, the hell happened there? Look, the front brake pads are gone, the back brake pads are gone, and the emergency brake is gone. So they raid all the chop shops in town and everybody that they know, and they find, all, they find one guy, and he's stolen front brake pads, back brake pads, and braking systems. And they say, we've got the guy. Keep your eyes out for anybody else who does that. Well, then there were, we, well, well, you should mention that we found some chop shops that they were stealing front brakes, and we found other chop shops, and they were stealing back brakes, and we found other chop shops, and they were stealing emergency brakes. They said, don't worry about them. Forget those guys. We're only interested in the people that cause people to crash, and those are the people that steal the entire system. <laughs> That's what we're doing, right? We're focused on people that break this entire system, chemicals that cause cancer. And it turns out there's not a very big list of them, but we've got a lot of other chemicals that are doing things, that are doing damage to these other pieces of the puzzle, and we have no way of knowing what those mixtures are capable of doing. Again, I'm not sounding an alarm. I just want you to understand it conceptually because it's, it's important. And uh, if we're ever going to figure out, you know, the other 57% of cancers that we don't understand, I think this is fertile ground. The can hallmarks of cancer imply synergies that should be predictable. We should be able to take a mutagen and something that disrupts DNA repair and get more than one plus one. Okay? And we should be able to take a mutagen and something that disrupts DNA repair and something that can produce growth signaling, and by something I mean a chemical that's in our food, and we should be able to also introduce a chemical that disrupts the kinds of tumor suppressors that would normally allow the chem this thing to stop, and we should be able to see some kind of advance of those chemicals conspiring together in common tissues. That's mixtures work that hasn't been done. It's really basic. And anybody who's an undergrad could understand this, who's taken this course now, and the work hasn't been done. That's really important stuff that needs to get done. We need to be able to anticipate synergies of chemicals acting on different targets and tissues, and we need to be able to act, anticipate synergies of non-carcinogens. We need to stop thinking about carcinogens as being the only problem. We've got this issue that we are only looking for carcinogens. We're only looking for the people that steal the entire brake systems but we're letting everybody else go. 
that doesn't work. If you haven't seen the special issue we put in Carcinogenesis, it is going crazy in terms of reads. Uh, it only came out in, um, I don't know, uh, 2015, in December or something. And like, I'm on ResearchGate. I'm a new researcher. I'll tell you that story just in a, in a second, just to cap things off. But um, I just put my stuff up on ResearchGate like six months ago, and I have like, six and a half thousand reads or something from the articles in this project. This has been a very popular piece of work. And I'm not even an academic, so I don't care. Uh, but people who are involved in the project are emailing me and say, are you watching what's going on with these articles? It's, it's crazy. Um, I'm telling you this because these were thoughtfully constructed articles along each hallmark. And in particular, if you haven't read the synthesis, I'd say get it and read it. We did, our, we did our very best to try and simplify it to the level that somebody who didn't have a cancer biology background, whether your background was risk assessment or toxicology or whatever, would be able to read it and understand it. And I encourage you to, to get the paper and to peruse it carefully. Following the workshop in Halifax, and I am just about done here, I was invited to uh, speak at the NIEHS in, in um, North Carolina. They brought in 75 scientists for two days, and our goal was to review what the project was about and what we had accomplished and let all the people in their staff weigh in on it. And we held workshops, and we discussed it, and we published a paper at the end uh, led by uh, their chief of staff, Mark Miller, and um, Linda Birnbaum, who was the uh, director of NIHS, uh, opened the symposium and hosted us for the two days. It was a fantastic event, really. And industry was there. There were people from industry as well. And the outcomes from the paper, and you could read the paper itself. It was recently published in Environmental Health Perspectives. But the, the key takeaway from my standpoint was the theoretical merits of the, of the hypothesis are well-founded with clear biological relevance. And I, I guess I know that government systems don't turn on a dime. I understand that risk assessment's not going to flip over tomorrow and start worrying about whether a chemical disrupts a hallmark or not. But as far as I'm concerned, if people understand this issue, it makes a difference. It will make a difference over the long haul as to how organizations structure themselves and how much attention is given to carcinogenicity and chemicals and carcinogenesis. And people that are at a higher level will be able to perhaps understand it and make decisions around whether or not there should be people doing this kind of an activity and whether funding gets to goes in that direction or not. So these things don't happen overnight. But as far as I'm concerned, we didn't get thrown out on our ear. So that was, that was a good thing. There were a lot of uh, people in the audience from a lot of different perspectives, really good discussion. And I think everybody recognizes that this is work that has to be done, and it's important. Um, IARC, uh, which has uh, you know, steadfastly focused on categories of carcinogenesis and monographs that are related to whether or not a chemical, single chemical is a carcin carcinogen, recently published mechanisms of carcinogenesis. And if you look down this list, you'll find it a lot of overlap with the hallmarks. So that doesn't mean that they've moved yet, but I guess as an institution, I say they've started to take all that mechanistic data that used to just sort of be in a throwaway section of their document, and they really tended to default to, when carcinogenicity came down to it, to the gold standard two-year in vivo rodent data, and they also said, and by the way, here's this mechanistic stuff. They started doing reviews of their work and said, you know, it's hard to, hard to interpret this mechanistic stuff because it's not even organized nicely. And so they decided to organize it and they put it into these bins, which coincidentally look a lot like some of the Hallmark's bins. So at least IARC is also moving in this direction because the science is now to the point that allows them to do that. So what are the uh, next steps? And I know I'm just five minutes over, right? Okay. Um, what are the next steps? We need low-dose chemistry work to help unravel the process of carcinogenesis. You know, some of the early work on two-stage, you know, initiation and promotion, done in the 30s. Um, the guy in Argentina, the Argentinian scientist, Rafa, who was doing uh, damage and promotion. Some of that really early work that is landmark, that work still needs to be done. So if you're in a research area and you've got the ability to do some basic bench research to test the effects of different chemicals acting together to produce synergies. That's like pioneering stuff. It's, it's, it, it seems straightforward enough, but it hasn't been done. So that's really important work, and I encourage you to look at whether or not there's ways in which you can build that into your own research agendas. Um, 
And of course, this is not an academic exercise. I'm interested in the practical. You know, I've, most of us have had cancer affect us in one way or another through our own families. And I know that risk assessment people are frustrated probably that they hear a lot about this mechanistic stuff, but it's like, what do we do with that? Um, some people have said to me, well, so what? So if we have 10,000 chemicals and they act on all these hallmarks, we can't eliminate all chemicals. No. But, you know, we can draw hard lines in the sand on things that we think are vitally important. We've kind of done that in some respects with things like the immune system. Everybody kind of recognized the immune system important, and so now we have something we call immune toxicity or immunotoxicology. And in most toxicology and risk assessments, we're looking at does this impact the immune system. So there's a segregated piece of toxicology that focuses on one system. And that's, that kind of approach might be relevant here. We might say, you know, we're not going to allow any chemicals that disrupt DNA repair. We, we have spent a couple of decades saying we were going to be really careful about what chemicals we introduce that are just mutagens, anything that's grossly mutagenic. And we drew that line, and industry worked around it. You know, that's just, they, they're chemists. They'll figure it out. So, you know, we could potentially say DNA repair is just as important as mutagenicity, and we want to focus on DNA repair and figure out how many things disrupt DNA repair, because that's at the initiating stage, and that's important. So there are ways in which you might be able to do this that could be more practical than just saying, you know, we've got 10,000 chemicals that act on everything, we can't possibly do anything about it. There are ways which this could be orchestrated that wouldn't impact industry in the way that, you know, everybody is concerned about. This was never an anti-chemical effort. This is a let's understand the science so we can make reasonable decisions about what needs to happen next, and there are probably reasonable ways forward if we put our minds to it. Uh, I had some stuff in here on Health Canada around the law. I'll ignore that. I'm going to go to questions. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you so much for uh, such an interesting talk that we really, we always appreciate these types of efforts that bring together uh, specialists to, to tackle these complex issues that are really challenging for us, both from a scientific and regulatory perspective. And I think you gave some really good suggestions on how practically we, we could kind of incorporate this into our way of thinking. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll open the, the floor up uh, to, to questions. First, um, if there's anyone on the phone, I don't know, Tim, if you could uh, basically remove the mute. If there's anyone on the phone right now, please just go ahead and ask any questions if you have, have some. Okay, we haven't heard anything. If you do at some point, please feel free to step in. At this point, we'll open it to the audience here in the room. If anyone wants to approach the microphone, that would probably be a good approach. And I'll invite you back up to answer the question. <coughs> Okay. Hi. Um, I have a couple of questions and comments, you can say. Uh, the cancer is, I think, which is not at all new thing to us, and it's been around for the last 5,000 years, I would say, because uh, some of the cause of the death of the mummies has been attributed to the cancer. And they're also using the chemical mixture, so probably we are uh, using these chemical mixtures more wisely because supposedly we are more knowledgeable as compared to the Romans uh, as far as the chemicals are concerned. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, but, but you and uh, we are more surrounded by the chemical mixtures than you and I were growing up. So I would like to put more weight on the chemical mixture for the cause of the cancer. And the other thing is that we... Uh, the lifespan has been increased, which means that we are being more subjected to these chemicals over the period of time as compared to the other counterparts of our uh, same species. And, uh, and, and the question is, where do you want to put this infectious agent uh, into the cause of the cancer, whether in the in environment or any other category you want to create? Thank you. Uh, when you say infectious agents, can you just clarify, like... HPV, for example, human papilloma virus, epstein virus viruses very much involved in lymphomas, for example, and HPV for the cervical cancer. So uh, there's certainly, um, we did a lot of work, you know, starting in the 60s on viruses and cancer, and we know that there are viruses that act on these mechanisms. What's I think has happened is, 
uh, whether it's by accident, industrial pollution that caused cancers, whether it's by viral infections that we've analyzed now and understand how they're acting, or whether it's through basic biology that allowed us to elucidate all these mechanisms and machinery, all of these things have sort of conspired to give us a picture that now allows us to see how this cancer unfolds. Um, when you say, where do I want to put it? Well, certainly infectious agents are a concern, and there are examples of HPV and other viruses that act on this machinery in, a, in this manner. I think what's interesting from my perspective is that viruses often act very precisely, much in the same way a chemical does. Uh, they don't act on necessarily all the hallmarks. They have discrete actions that they make. One of the things I would encourage you to think about is this. Um, much like a virus might only act on certain parts of this machinery, and yet that can increase your chances of getting cancer, and you may end up with cancer as a result, um, there are also examples where viruses could potentially act on that machinery and you don't get cancer. And similarly, there are people who have uh, genetic defects, for example. Uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, um, there's a condition uh, where your DNA repair is broken uh, called the uh, zero derma pigmentosum, I believe, XP. And uh, your DNA repair is dysfunctional. And those people go spend their life under an umbrella because if they get too much DNA damage, they will actually get cancers. But only about half of them get cancers. Now, that's a big number. And if you've got BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation, you know, some women will actually get a mastectomy in concerns that they might get cancer. So, but what we know is that single genotypic, uh, phenot uh, geno single genotypes that predispose somebody to cancer don't act on all these mechanisms. They only act on parts of the mechanisms in the hallmarks that I described, and yet that has such an impact on the disease that it allows the disease to then occur in some very high percentage of the population. To me, that what we've learned from viruses and what we've learned from genetic diseases where a single genetic uh, phenotype that it, uh, results in a disease in a high percentage of the population, those should be the kinds of red flags to tell us that chemicals can, that can act discriminately on those same kinds of discrete mechanisms may in fact predispose somebody to cancer in ways that would increase your chances of cancer increasing considerably. So I, I don't know where I would categorize or place infectious diseases in terms of the scheme of things, but I think what we've learned from those uh, viruses, for example, and the way that they act on the machinery, and what we've learned about from genetic diseases, tells us something about how we might be concerned about chemicals that also similarly act on something fairly discreet, and yet then predispose some percentage of the population to a much higher incidence or potential for cancer. Um, <laughs> you've talked about some very important things. I think one of the things in research, there's always this trade-off do you try and get answers to really important things, or do you try to get answers to things you can answer? And I think one of your challenges here is you're talking about something very complex that is going to be very challenging to get consistent, credible evidence. Like your 53% low dose or 53 low dose, that was based on the literature, right, literature studies. So the question there is, what percentage of those studies, if you redid them, would you get the same result? And unfortunately, when people have looked into that, and it's even worse in animal studies, it's quite low. So you're starting with a base of what is evidence, but if you actually review it sort of like what a regulator would want it reviewed to, you're going to find it's not really reliable enough. Um, I don't know if it's called the reproducibility crisis. You know, I understand, I understand the issue, but I guess what I'm saying is I don't see it as a problem. I, what, I, what I know is we now have good evidence that we have chemicals that can act at, at levels of exposure that are um, what people are exposed to. You're saying that the base out of this particular project wasn't big, but you... No, 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 no. It, it wasn't reliable. I, I mean... Some companies have done this, and they found they can only replicate maybe 40% of the published studies. So that's a real challenge for you. 
And you know, it's a challenge of how do you do science cooperatively in such a, a very complex situation where you need all the pieces to be credible? Well, what I'm saying is we wouldn't rely on anything out of this particular project as the basis for decision making. What we're trying to do is illustrate how this problem manifests itself or could manifest itself. So the question that you're asking about reproducibility, I would agree, that's an issue. And if we were going to develop some sort of systematic way of looking at it, that would be something that we would want to build into the research that follows. But the point is, is that prior to this project happening, people didn't even understand the problem. If you said, how do, cancer, uh, how do chemicals acting on specific mechanisms potentially contribute to carcinogenesis, there wasn't even a coherent way of formulating that problem to look at it. We wanted to lay it out in a manner that people could understand both how the framework helps you understand what the disease does. I think they agree with that. You, you, and, you, you've defined a very important problem. Right. What my questions are about is how do we enable the scientific community to really actually do something about it? Okay, so there's two questions. One is the reproducibility issue, which I'm saying you can build that into the processes that you in, endeavor to undertake to, make, to illustrate how this unfolds. But the second part is the, how do we get the com scientific community to do something about it? Well, I would say that in general, the government has, has a somewhat of an instrumental role in influencing what private sector does, or not private sector, but um, pri uh, institutional research at universities. And if the government formulates a problem and says, we're concerned about this, just by doing grant, small grant work, extramural research, and inspiring people to be thinking along these lines, you will get researchers in labs at universities that will give you a multiplier effect for your money because they will think, then think, pursue yeah. an agenda that uh, is aligned. Yeah, I think we're going to disagree on the confidence you should have in that kind of research funding and the results from it. And, sure. and we'll just have to leave it at that. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the point. And that, that is always a challenge. And that's why we appreciate these kind of group efforts that, that look at the literature as a whole to make sure there's consistency across, across the papers. And from a research perspective, we're actually keen to, to do studies where we would layer ke several chemicals on top of each other and see the outcomes to help build the, the scientific base. So we have one more question. We have one more. Yeah. I, thought I, I thought I was getting cut off. Thanks very much for the very thought provoking and, and really understandable presentation. I really appreciate the way you, uh, you know, everybody could understand that. Um, I, I'd like to go back to the AOPs. And um, I think that if you approach the AOP program with sort of the long-term vision of that program, that in fact it really plays into exactly what you're saying here. So an individual AOP is a linear construct and it's a very oversimplified process and just measuring these key events. But the long-term vision of that program is networks, and that's exactly what you're talking about. And I think that if people with the same kind of thinking as you were involved in those prog uh, programs and helping to develop those networks, you might get your answers, and you, you would be able to prioritize you know, chemicals that perturb this pathway and that pathway and that pathway where they converge on key events before an adverse outcome and where they converge on an adverse outcome. So I, I'd encourage you to think more about AOPs and become involved, more involved in that, and I wondered about your sort of uh, perspective on that. Yeah, if you read the paper, we're actually quite... Uh, if you read the synthesis paper, the Goodson at uh, al. paper, um, we comment on adverse outcome pathway exactly in that manner. We, we understand that within the adverse outcome pathway community, uh, there is a vision and voices that are thinking what we're thinking. And, and we're basically, in the paper, we say we're supportive of that effort to the extent that it can accommodate that kind of thinking. What we've seen in practice at the current moment from a risk assessment standpoint is this sort of reliance on that, you know, we're only going to stack chemicals from a cumulative standpoint if they meet this very tight criteria, which in practice means that there isn't much cumulative risk assessment done using that method. Um, that's, that's just sort of an observation. But we're, and as far as me personally being involved in the AOP, I'm, I don't, I'm not really either funded or in a position to be involved actively with that community. But there were 174 researchers in this project. Many of them are 
active participants in those groups, and we're supportive of that effort, and I certainly hope we get there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so please join me once again in, in uh, thanking for this wonderful talk. It's been very helpful for us. Thank you.